All right, everybody, welcome to The Good Time Show. I'm your host, Damon Epps, and today we have two incredible guests joining us who are making waves in the business and tech world, Michael Burton and Clayton Woodruff, the dynamic duo behind Lockstop. I haven't screwed that up yet, have I? No. Okay, great. Michael Burton, the CEO and founder of Lockstop, is a seasoned leader with 12 years of experience in the Marine Corp, along with his expertise in human intelligence and omni-channel business management at Walmart. Wow, what in the hell is that? His strategic vision drives Lockstop's growth, and then Clayton Woodruff, the CEO and founder of Lockstop, brings a wealth of experience in trail building, app development, and IT. His work in constructing cycling trails and app development ensures Lockstop product innovation and seamless automation. Oh, wait, operation. Let's try it. I, you know, I got a speech impediment. Uh, before we dive into the conversation, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Blake Street House. It isn't just a social club. It's a community hub where diverse minds come together to foster inclusivity and innovation. Whether you're unwinding after a long day or connecting with your peers, Blake Street House is where creativity meets community. And The Ledger, the world's first bikeable building, offers a state-of-the-art workspace solutions, redefining the concept of work-life integration in downtown Bentonville. It's more than just a place of work. It's a hub for creativity, community, and innovation. And they're all under one hub, you know, runway. So, you know, let's give a shout-out. Okay, and now let's dive into the conversation with Michael Burton and Clayton Woodruff. All right, guys. So let's talk about like, um, let's talk about this lock stop. What is it? What's it all about? How'd you come up with it? Yeah, I guess we start from the beginning on how you come up with it. I feel like coming up with stuff is always that oh shit moment, right? You know, and my oh shit moment for this was my family and I, we had recently moved from San Diego um, to Bentonville. So when you're coming from California, you're carrying a lot of a lot of things with you and you lock up everything there, your, your car, your dog, everything, right? And so we're riding into Bentonville Farmer's Market. My responsibility is the maintenance of the bikes. My wife's responsibility, she'll listen to this. She got upset the last one. Um, her responsibility <laughs> is the locks, right? And so bikes are rolling, pedals are doing the things that they're supposed to do. We get into the farmer's market, and I'm like, Kel, throw me the locks. And you just see by the expression, like, well, there's her oh shit moment in mind both at the same time. So we didn't, we didn't bring the locks. And like everyone in Bentonville, we spent too much money on our bikes. So I stood there while my wife walked around with my kids, you know, get, gathering produce and all the fun things. And I'm standing there. I'm like, how do we have self-driving cars and I still have to carry a bike lock? And so that's really, you know, where the idea started and chewed on it for a little bit until got to grad school and then met this dude. And I'll let him kind of pick up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've spent a ton of time in the cycling industry. And <clears throat> I mean, I've been riding my whole life all over the world, actually. So uh, and even for me, as much of a rider as I am, I literally never carry a bike lock. Uh, and I mean, this is I've been in Colorado and Whistler and all over and. And when him and I got together, started riding bikes, uh, Mike, I always call him an idea fairy because he's just constantly pumping out ideas. Uh, one of the early ones was, was what we called the bike blanket uh, to kind of go over your bike um, truck bed, and uh, which, which kind of exists in a way. But uh, then he started talking about this. And when we got into the MBA program, specifically New Venture Development, which is their entrepreneurship hub, um, we were like, man, let's, this, I think you got something here. And I was like, I have you know, a lot of connections in the cycling industry. Like, let's, let's explore this. And that's kind of what just blossomed from there. Very cool. That's, um, I will tell you though, I don't, I also don't carry a bike lock at all. And it's real dumb. Yeah. Um, we all know it every time we sit there in the restaurant, yeah. in the bar, in the cafe. For sure. Like, oh, please. And I'm just waiting for the, I mean, look, it is Bentonville. So I think it's like, unlike any other place in the world where, um, it is the last, I truly believe it's the last place on earth that, I, I, I don't believe my bike's going to get stolen yet. I know those weeks are like, yeah. as the growth comes, there's going to be one little crappy kid that moves into this town and there's going to be a few more or we're going to have that rush where there's a bunch of bike thefts in like two or three days where somebody comes in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, I shouldn't even be saying this. Now I'm, no, now, yeah. now, I'm, now I'm putting it out there that there's available bikes for everyone to go. Um, yeah, we'll cut that out. Maybe. <laughs> maybe we'll cut that out so I don't hey, lose my bike. Yeah, we have a solution. Or maybe we put it out there. May we cause a controversy. Maybe this is how we exactly. really stop the launch. No right? one is locking Locks their up. bikes. No bikes one is locking their bikes at all here in Bentonville. There is hundreds of thousands of bikes. Um, 
<laughs> no, I don't really lock my bikes here, but I also will tell you, I hate carrying bike locks around. Um, everything is so heavy and it's brutal. Yeah. I don't want to do it. So are these things out here yet? How does it work? How does this thing work? Yeah, you know, so in the Marine Corps, I try to go all the way back there when I'm developing anything. We had, you know, this acronym called KISS, keep it simple, stupid. And I try to take that through everything that I do. And so when we were developing, you know, Lockstop, we're thinking like, what are people already used to doing out there? Micromobility, ride shares, all those things, you know, we use our mobile device, we activate it, we use it. And so Clayton and I, when we were developing this, wanted to take that very similar approach. Like, how do we make a bike lock weigh as less? you know, equal to your phone. So um, the big thing was making sure that the device that we have can update the existing infrastructure. You know, the time as a buyer at Walmart taught me a lot. Um, Sam Walton taught me a lot, even though I never met the man. He's like, hey, get your costs as low as you possibly can and lower the barrier of entry for your customers. So making sure that we design this lock, then it can attach to anything and then wrap that in a patent. But then, you know, the user experience, it needs to be so intuitive when I walk up even if I've never used it, which no one has because it's a novel idea, I'll know what to do. And so simply scan the QR code on top and that's it. The bike lock unlocks, it associates with your account. The next thing you have to do is just put it back, put in, back in and then you're locked up. And so very simple, very simple. It's very cool. And are these at Bentonville yet? We are about to launch a beta test here in Bentonville. We're actually working with AWE, so all, uh, let's see, Art Wellness Enterprises. And we're going to do a pilot program, Crystal Bridges Momentary. Um, and we're actually about to head out to Boulder, Colorado, to talk to them about a pilot program as well. So we're, we're like right there, you know, of, of getting these devices out there, really getting it in production and having like the full run. So we're finishing up app development. We're, you know, getting all the little bugs out of this guy. Uh, yeah, so we're, you know, weeks out. That's great. That's exciting. So I feel like I heard about this some like months ago, I mean, not even months ago, years ago. Yes, it's been yeah. two years. Yeah, right <laughs> at two years, man. I'm telling you, bringing anything from zero to one, holy shit, it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, believe me, I've yeah. been here and I'm like, oh, I got this Planet Good Times idea. I'm just going to activate the community. I'm right. going to start this. Man, getting this podcast off the ground, I've, I've kind of taken a little bit of a break just to kind of get things back up and running. Man, it is not easy no. to do things, especially it's just the two of you guys right now, right? We have yeah. a couple others. So we have an IoT um, guy that we brought on, software ar architect, IoT developer, AI developer. Um, and we've recently brought on a CTO that's kind of leading, you know, uh, the future of our technology. So four of us strong right now. We're in the process of building the team. You know, as we um, get ready to pilot with a lot of these partners, we want to make sure, you know, we're ready to hit the ground running. I think we've, uh, you know, hit some traction that we didn't forecast a little earlier than we expected. And so now it's just building that foundation and making sure super strong. Oh, that's good. Yeah. It's a good problem to yeah, have, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a real good uh, problem now. You know, we're, we're scrambling this week to try and get everything ready for, like I said, this Boulder trip. Just uh, Oh, wow. So the bold, so the Boulder guys came out of nowhere kind of? Or? They did, yeah. We got connected with the uh, bike. It was actually a bike cop organization called IPEMBA. It's the International Police Mountain Bike Association. I personally hadn't even heard of it. Oh yeah, because uh, I, I yeah everybody they were well they were all everybody was just here. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow. If I screwed up, there was right? there was the largest <laughs> amount of cops on bikes I've ever seen right. in my life. I came out. I was like, all right, yeah. don't do anything. Thank wrong. God, I'm old now. Exactly. <laughs> so we got connected with them and showed them this. And there's one guy in particular who's like the bike theft guru, and he was a bike cop in Boulder for 30 years, still is. And uh, he was just blown away. And I mean, that was what, June, I think. And we're literally like, get you guys out here. Let's let's do this. And it, it's it's kind of a funny full circle for me because I actually went to CU Boulder and I spent 10 years out there. And so I moved back here in 2015 and I actually spent 15 years in Colorado in general. So it was just kind of hilarious because we've always talked about, hey, let's just launch this here. Let's grow it kind of organically nearby to manage it. Then all of a sudden Boulder's like, hey, we're, we want to bring you out here and check this out. I'm like, uh, you know, tell my wife, like, man, let's move back to Boulder. <laughs> so, so you said you, you rode a lot of bikes. Were you, were you a pro biker where you did the whole thing? Or are you just in a, well, no, no, definitely. I never, I raced a lot younger. I mean, I rode since I was little, but got like very into it in high school. Uh, I was mostly just really into kind of what they would call the free ride movement, which was like this big mountain, you know, Red Bull Rampage type stuff. Uh, and then Whistler going up to the bike park up there. Um, so, and then of course- Is that like downhill? Downhill, yeah. 
So I was like super. I did that. Super into down. I wrecked. Yeah, <laughs> I've done that. I times. hit my chest <laughs> so hard. I've never. Yeah. 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 Was I that was, the one and only time you did it, and you did not do it after? Well, that I, you that? know, I don't. It was like we went up to. Um, it was in it was in California, and so right. we just all went camping, and I I, I don't know what where we were. I don't know if that was maybe Big Bear. I think okay. it was Big Bear. Yeah, we went to Big Bear. Yeah, see, so you did some big, some big stuff. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah I, guess. I mean, it was, yeah, we were up there and we were cruising. I was having a good time. And then I just slid on some sand and I just hit the ground yep. with my chest so hard. And it's all part of the experience. And you know, you have best friends there because the first thing they did was start laughing. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's. <laughs> Are you okay? Don't, yeah, don't no, trust the guy. They didn't even ask that. He just started laughing. Yeah. And then he asked if I was okay. Yeah. And I was like, well, I think I'm dying, but it, yeah. you know, it's fine. Yeah, it's that's, fine. So anyways, that's, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Whistler riding downhill up there. And then um, in Colorado, of course, being being there for 15 years. So but in terms of like profession, it was just the cycling world being trail building. I mean, I was just building a lot of big shit and, you know, riding as much. As I oh, could. got it. So you, so that's where you started trail building? Yes. Now, which your now your brother is the owner of Progressive Trails, yes. correct? He's he's the owner of that. Started in 2006 here, and I moved back here for a little bit. Built you know here slaughter pen early days. I think that was like phase two, and then I moved back to Colorado, uh, and then about two years later, I, I rejoined him, and actually I was running the whole West Coast operations. So a lot of Colorado work. Oh, very cool. Okay, got it. So you went from so you you came back. And what did you, what'd you get, what'd your brother, why'd your brother get into, was your brother already doing that? Was he? No, I mean, it was like, he just basically fell into it. He actually has a master's in education. Uh, <laughs> and he was like in this process of finishing his master's, trying to get a job in education. And at the time, I mean, he was, you know, riding, of course, and racing. And they had a downhill series uh, locally. It was like Devil's Den, Eureka Springs. And he was the only person that really did that kind of riding. And when the Walton boys, Tom specifically, was trying to, you know, build the trail building community here, you know, he was kind of looking for other sort of people that knew how to build different types of trail aside from just your basic single track. And his name kind of came into the fold. And so he got just sort of asked to do it. I mean, didn't even know that it was a thing, right? Like who heard of trail building as a profession? Um, was he out of construct? Did he do like construct? Nothing. No, I mean, he did, he, he had a background on like landscaping a lot. He had done a bunch of landscaping and, and uh, so yeah, it was a lot of fly by the seat of your pants, kind of figure it out as you go. I mean, there are some books out there. I mean, you know, not to get too technical on the trail building parts, but it's mostly about water mitigation. Um, it's significantly changed now, but uh, yeah. So he just kind <laughs> of figured it out. And then I came back and, and same thing, figured it out for a little bit. And like I said, I, I left for a couple of years and then, and then like he, he sort of built this whole company at that point. So it was just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I just had Gary Vernon on, as you know. Yeah, and so, nice. yeah. So like. Yeah, they, before we watch this, everybody will be educated on the Gary Vernon yeah. side of things, nice. and then I'll do the, yeah. And so, yeah. all right. So then you started buying nicer, nicer bikes, and um, well, I'd always bought the nice bikes. Oh, you did. So, <laughs> oh, you were already that guy. Yeah, so, yeah. No, I was, you know, have you ever had a bike stolen? You know, I actually have mostly had bike gear stolen. Oddly enough, I have not as had, I've not personally had as much. That's bike a compliment, stolen. isn't it? Is, no yeah. one's stealing your bike; they're stealing the clothes you're wearing. Yeah, like, dang. I yeah, I mean, guess it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Even was your bike not even locked up? They stole, or they just uh, stole the gear no, because you? I had somebody steal. You know, literally, it was like moto and bike gear. I mean, I made it really easy for them because it was in a nice, awesome bag, like moto bag, and they actually came into my carport and like and stole it. It was sitting in my carport. This was in Fayetteville. Rude. Yeah. Right. A bunch of a holes. Yeah, I saw. But, but his, his, he's got the best. Uh, he's got the best bike story that that he's. Oh, he's told several times. Oh, yeah. gosh, yeah. Okay, so, let's know, let's hear know, this bike story. Let's let's let's, let's I, hear you it. You know, it's not it's not uh, as good as Clayton tees it up to be. You know, uh, I started off Maysville, Kentucky. Grew up in this small, you know, two bedroom apartment in uh, an apartment complex called Beechwood. You know, government subsidized housing. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, it means the projects, right? And so you're not getting a lot of new stuff going up. So I was definitely not that guy getting the brand new bike. I mean, I think I got my first bike when I was six years old. Um, and man, this thing was freaking sweet, right? 24 inch candy apple red, like sweet ass little chrome pegs on there. And I rode that thing around all day till the street lights came on. And uh, then, you know, mom's calling, come in, come in. And so I go lock it up to the water meter, you know, behind our apartment, because that's what you lock things to um, there and lock it up. Next morning, super pumped to go ride my bike, run out there. There's no bike to ride. 
And, you know, so the bike got lifted in the middle of the night. And in the neighborhood where I grew up, uh, it was like, okay, I'm not going to go look, you know. <laughs> They obviously needed it more than I did. And so it's really funny to come full circle, you know, 30 plus years later and be the founder of a public bike lock network. So um, that was my one and only bike that I had stolen. You know, I, I, I wasn't like Clayton. I didn't grow up riding a lot. I'm usually a reflection of, you know, my community. So I lived in Hawaii, California a long time. So what part I, of Hawaii? Uh, I was in Kaneohe Bay, so on Oahu. So I spent a lot of time, you know, there. So that in, military stuff? Yeah, that was okay. military stuff. So I just happened to be fortunate, um, you know, with that uh, – that assignment that I was only a half a mile away from a private beach that just had this wicked four to foot, you know, four to six foot swell that I could just go surf three times a day. So I spent a lot of my time. You this know, is the kind of military surf, I'm right? talking That's about. Yeah, right there. You should hear some of the story. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the best. Yeah. <laughs> some of them I'm just like, man, that's intense. Others I'm like, what? You got paid to do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's pretty great. Yeah. So, all right. So Hawaii. And then you said where? Yeah, so Hawaii, California. I say I spent a lot of my time. So you served in California, yes. then you went where? Yeah, so Hawaii, I think, was before then. I've been in California a few times, I think. Okay. They just love me over there. They just keep forcing keep coming me back. Direction. And then yeah. you try to leave, and then they. Get I don't you think back. I ever really tried to leave. They just kept saying, hey, you have to leave. And then they'd put me in Hawaii or then back in California. Uh, but a lot of the time, you know, I was training or deployed. So, you know, all the fun places that everyone likes to visit on vacation, Iraq, yeah. Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. I do. All those fun places. They have beaches. Yeah, they got to get water yeah. shipped there a little bit. But yeah. there's a lot exactly. of sand. There yeah. is a lot of sand there to go is. with it. But, um, well, that's. Okay, so then you did your military stuff, and then you moved it. Did you just start biking when you got to Bentonville? I, you know, I bought a bike, I think, the last maybe two months when we lived in San Diego. I bought a bike. I'm like, cool, I'm going to be a biker. And I went out. I'm like, man, this is boring as all get out. It was just this flat little trail. I'm like, I'm not going to be a biker. And so, Was it a mountain bike? Yeah, it, it was a mountain bike. I don't know if it would qualify as a mountain bike compared to Bentonville standards. Right. But, it's a you know, whole it different was, thing. Yeah, it's yeah. a whole different thing. You know, this thing was probably 400 bucks. And at that point, I remember my wife and I having a conversation. She's like, are you going to spend $400 on a bicycle? I know. It's crazy. Right? Now, and it's like, are you going to spend you say, five? Are you, <laughs> you know? You, and we know what the last three Dude, years. it wasn't even expensive. I spent $2,300 yeah. on it. It was a steal. Yeah. yeah. steal. I got it. My brother owns a bike shop, and I'm like, I got it. I mean, I got the bro discount, you know? Like, that was only six grand. Which one does your brother yeah. own? Now? Yeah. The hub. Oh, he owns the hub. He owns the hub. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know he owned the hub. He does. Yeah. I know. I buy your bike. I basically buy your bike. Yeah. Every bar tab. Yeah, I bet. Hey, you can name drop me maybe. I love that. Yeah, they don't care. Tell them Woody. I'll tell them them I know Woody. (laughs) Put it on Woody. They're like, hey, can I get... You know what I don't do? I don't ever get the discount that I'm supposed to get over there. Yeah, right. I always forget. Funny side story, I actually don't either. Every time I don't even have like my name in there. I'll like go in there and I'm like, ah, I mean, I'm Woody's brother, you know. They're like, oh yeah, we'll give you the discount. I always forget that I get one because of like Blake Street or whatever. Oh yeah, yeah. I think you nice. get a Blake Street yeah. discount over there. Yeah. Um, it's a great bar. It is. Yeah, it's one of my favorite bars for sure. Yeah. Good margaritas. Okay, so what? So what? In the military, did I guess this is that um, all the mechanisms and all the kind of technology that because what's your background in the military yeah no i'm a non-technical founder um through and through so i was a counterintelligence human intelligence specialist so effectively just got paid pretty well and traveled around and, and had conversations with people what does that mean in the military yeah he was a spy he <laughs> yeah i was about to say what, is, what does that mean <laughs> no it's a, you know it's real it realistically kind of what you do is you're going into a place like we typically vacation to and you know, you find one of those uh, individuals that are from the local economy that may have access to information that's appealing to you or some of your stakeholders. And you go befriend that individual, you know, understand who they are. They understand who you are and start trying to understand, you know, what is it that drives you, what's important to you. And then, you know, making sure that you're bringing that to the relationship. And then all of a sudden you say, hey, P.S., I'm U.S. intelligence, um, and we've had a relationship for quite a while. Um, let's make this official. And, and, you know, kind of reporting up those conversations, um, the ones that should be. And so, yeah, I mean, it was very fortunate. I got to experience a lot of different cultures, speak with a lot of different people from, you know, dirt farmers up to high levels of the government. And so, um, you know, human intelligence really is that. It's just out having conversations with people, making friends, and understand what makes them tick. Maybe I could do that in the military. You probably could, yeah. I'd be really good at that. 
till everybody started shooting at each other. And <laughs> That's it. Be like, can we just not? Can we just, yeah, like that guy, that guy over there. Yeah, that guy. You know what I mean? I don't like hunting. I definitely don't like. Yeah, I don't. I'll do it. Yeah, that sounds. No, good. no. Yeah, that's what I said. Someone's like, Mike, have you been in a gunfight? I'm like, if I get in the gunfight, then stuff has gone really awry, right? You know. So I'm the guy who talks to people. I'm the guy who talks to people before the gunfight happens. And so if I'm in the gunfight, then you know, shit went really south. You know. And so um, that was a good aspect for me. I got to you know kind of travel around and then um, you know not have to get shot at all the time. That's good. Yeah, that is good. Yeah. That's Eventually, good. I think they hit most of the time. So the fewer times you can get shot at, the less likely you are to get shot, right? So, I mean, the beauty of his experience, though, just with us, is that he spent his life in security. And so, okay, that, that's what I was trying yeah. to get at. Of like, how is this? Yes. How is this military background yeah, gone for the yeah. safety of your bikes? Yeah, that's a good thing. Um, you know, so part of my role is doing threat vulnerability assessments. And so I'd travel around the world, military installations or folks that are traveling abroad. And I would do these very um, comprehensive assessments of military installations, government buildings, or, you know, targeted buildings and kind of understand, hey, where are our gaps in security? So playing red cell, if I'm the thief, the similar to how we approach this, you know, we approach this with the mind of a bike thief. If I'm a bike thief, how am I still in your bike? And then based on those gaps we identify in an installation or in a bike lock, um, we go out and find either, you know, the physical deterrence or kind of the technology um, that will strengthen that to continue to make the, the target hard. And that's what we've done here is we really look to think through all the ways a bike thief is going to steal a bike. And then we um, filled those gaps with either, you know, physical um, materials or some kind of technology. The thing is one hefty looking bike lock. Yeah. Yeah, it's heavy. 20, yeah, it's heavy. So our constant joke is that we developed the lightest bike lock in the world because you don't have to carry it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey, that's right. I know I read that. I was like, yeah. I go, really, man? I don't know why they, yeah. I was like, doesn't this thing attach? I'm like, I'm like, not even, I'm like, yeah, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, it's the lightest one in the world and it fits on the, yeah. I was yeah. like, why did they make it so light? <laughs> How do they do that? It's like, oh, okay, now yeah. I get it. We've uh, had that I question. Mean, I, like, I would never carry that. I'm like, I, I hope not, because that means you've taken it from the place it's supposed to be. Yeah. Now you've stolen the. Now you have stolen the, yeah, 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 the lock stop. And, yeah. and this does have GPS, and we know where you are. Yeah. You know, so don't try we, to. Carry. We can get far. I mean, honestly, that was the big, big value prop for us. Right? It's like, you know, again, being in the bike world forever, nobody carries locks. Period, for the most part, and then yeah, because all I do is to be light. Yeah, especially in mountain biking. I mean, now commuters, obviously you are, but even then, yeah. you know, a yeah. big heavy chain like this, I mean, it's 10 pounds. Uh, so we're like, okay. It how used to not matter. Now, like, yeah. if I'm carrying water bottles and stuff, I'm like. I well, I mean, again, like being in that, it's like it was all, the Camelback was just amazing and everybody wore it. I wore it constantly and then it got to the fanny pack. That was a whole thing. And I broke down, finally got one. And then it, now it's gotten to the point where everything is fully integrated. You know, everything's integrated with the tools and the water bottles, which was like, in the 90s, that's what we used to do, you know, is, is use water bottles. So now when you talk about locks, it's just like, of course, I'm not going to carry that. Uh, and so it's it's adding that level, you know, for one, the convenience, of course, but just adding that level of security where if you were to carry a lock, you're probably not carrying this. You know, you're not carrying a chain that weighs 10 pounds. It's going to take, you know, a while to get through. Uh, and then, of course, we can just add all the technology because it's there since we're not moving it around. So we can have, like you said, visual deterrence. Uh, audio deterrent, so we have like a notification system. You know, if, if somebody was to try and clip it or grind it, it would literally send your phone a notification. You know, we're still exploring the like skunk spray or, or, uh, or, <laughs> yeah. or like a dye pack. Yeah, dye, dye <laughs> pack. For real? Like, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's a joke, but it's also true because there's a there is a company out there um, that, that does individual bike locks, and they literally have one that that has. I don't think it's a dye pack, but it's like a skunk spray in it. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah. You're like that is really funny. Wouldn't that be amazing? You thought bike security was boring, and you got folks. Out <laughs> yeah, people. Like, it's also yeah. just hysterical. Like, yeah, it's, right. like, yeah. it's like okay, he stole your bike. He may get it, may not get it, yeah. but now you've just really pissed him off. <laughs> exactly. I think about <laughs> the people that are, are around that person. You're yeah, like, oh, great. I did nothing wrong here. Yeah. He might have given up, but then after you sprayed him with skunk spray, that dude is determined <laughs> to destroy that yeah. thing. I mean, I would. If I got sprayed by oh, a skunk, yeah. I'd be like, oh, this lock stop is going down. Yeah. <laughs> I am going to <laughs> murder uh, yeah. this lock stop. Exactly. That's really funny. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so what's it, what, how did you get, I know you guys came up, how you came up with it, but have you guys always been entrepreneurs or what was the dream? It's been a mix. I mean, for me, it's been a mixed bag. I mean, obviously I've worked in sort of a startup world. Um, my job after I 
graduated and kind of worked here on the trails a little bit was I worked for a video game development company. Okay. And so it was, I mean, I say startup, it was a $90 million game, but it was still very much a startup environment where I was part of this operations team. Again, I knew nothing about operations or tech. I mean, I was like pre-med, you know, that obviously didn't go that route. Um, and so I've always kind of been around. Oh, that. you were going to be a doctor. I was. A handsome doctor. Yeah, guy. <laughs> he is a yeah, good looking yeah. man. You know what I mean? You would have been. Down and everything, you, know? you know, I guess you just fat, you found love. There's no reason to find a doctor. You're yeah, like, why, why work so hard? Why work so hard? Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. Um, so, anyways, like, you know, so I've, I've kind of been around that in that sense. And then, of course, with PTD, I mean, it was, you know, my brother had been doing it for, I think, two years before I joined. PTD? Progressive Child Design. So okay, there we go. I know, but I just wanted to know. He's all about acronyms. I know. Yeah. They're like the whole acronym saying yeah. uh, PDD? Yeah. PTD? PDD. Yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, he can go into the Walmart world. It's, it's just as bad there, I think, as the military, the acronyms. But anyway, so I, you know, was with that. And obviously I helped grow that for over eight years. And, and I was running my own thing in Colorado. So it's like, yes, I've always kind of been in and around it. Uh, but this is the first kind of true thing that I've, I've started with, with Mike here, where we've like, both of us are starting this again from zero to one. So... Yeah. And me, I, we had lifestyle businesses. I owned a photo film company when I was in California. So did a lot of uh, event photography and had a videography team. And then, you know, we've owned rentals in California here. Um, but a scalable venture, completely, you know, different game. Uh, my, my background's so nonlinear. I spent 12 years in the Marine Corps and then I had to figure out really quickly what I wanted to be when I grew up. So um, went and did a master of education to become a school teacher. Realized really quickly, no, this isn't my calling. Uh, yeah, it's that's out. tough. Yeah, you it's know? tough. Similar yeah. to my brother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a, yeah. yeah. I love it. It just never occurred to me. Well, I mean, I looked at my grades and that probably would do. It was yeah. like, I probably shouldn't be a teacher. You know, that's probably. <laughs> I probably should have looked at my grades before I went and did a master okay, of education. Yeah, well, you... I shouldn't be a teacher. Uh, but yeah, I've done that. What grade did you want to teach? Eighth, just... eighth grade. Yeah. Why eighth grade? You know what? That don't... sounds like the worst possible grade i think it was because it was the easiest test You're like hey eighth <laughs> oh they, grade they test you on specific grades oh yeah you have to test for specific grades you're, and you feel like an idiot right you go in and if you test you're like, oh, wow. wait eighth is the easiest it was you not know, first not first right. oh no i couldn't do first i have i have three littles at home and i love each and each and every one of them but i'm definitely not first grade teacher material okay got yeah. it okay i was like what well, little can, too regiment, you know you're like, oh, you don't, you know, you have to learn to chew on erasers correctly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, eat your crayons appropriately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. All right. I was, yeah. I was scared there. I was like, I felt like I could do the, I could do that. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't want to, but yeah. anyway, sorry. Go no, on. no. Yeah, I did tattoos for a long time too. I thought, you know, I really did enjoy tattoos. I love art, so I um, did a lot of that when I was in. Hawaii. So you're somewhat of an artist as well, huh? Yeah, I do. I love to paint, draw, write. You know, all the all the fun things. So, so you're pretty, and he's fancy. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. We're Here we're a go. good duo there. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like everyone that comes to Bentonville, you find your way to Walmart. So spent a couple of years over there um, as a buyer managing the automotive chemicals and refrigerant category. And then spent a little bit of time over at Sam's Club as a senior product manager. Um, but, you know, really pulling out the value from kind of each one of those roles. And what we found is this very nonlinear background has helped us solve problems, mm -hmm. you know, completely different than what most people do. It gives us, you know, experiences to select from, um, you know, that not a lot of folks that have this very linear background, you know, have. And so um, I think originally I used to look at it as, oh, gosh, I'm never getting hired. And then I would get hired and I'm like, oh, I can't do this. And, you know, I would leave and I'm saying, I'm never getting hired because each time they'd say, oh, you have quite a few, uh, you know, historical roles here. And, you know, for me, I looked at those as like, dude, each one of those roles, I learned so much about something. And now with having our own. What does the word historical roles mean? Was that a compliment or an insult? You know, you could take it either way. Yeah, like old jobs, effectively. Like, what oh. are the, yeah, what are, what are the past employments? You know, anytime you're going into an interview, right, they're looking over your Got resume. It. Like, and okay. they, have, they find a way to, like, fancy up, yeah, like, exactly. well, this thing's all over the place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was it. It's like, yeah, that's, that's a nice <laughs> way of saying it's a shit show. Yeah, I think, whoa, whoa. Yeah, so, you, so you don't know what, who you are. Yeah. Okay. I would have probably just said that to myself. I'm like, ah, this is bad, you yeah. know? Um, and then, you know, once we launched this scalable venture, you start to realize that, man, that's the real value of having this very nonlinear background experiences with different people, different cultures, different, you know, responsibilities. And so, it, I mean, it continues to, you know, add value to what we're trying to do. I mean, the, yeah, just on this journey, it's like going zero to one, especially with just two of us is me have to be able to figure out everything. Like mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're doing budgeting, we're doing financial projections, we're trying to design a product 
we're trying to design like an app. I mean, I literally design the UI UX for our beta app that we're gonna launch, and I'm not a UI UX developer. Like, so I just like was like, oh, Figma, let's let's figure this out. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's not great. You know, don't get me wrong, but you know, it's it it's like it is something that will get us to where we need to go to that next step, which then it can obviously you know get funding and then really launch like a legit app that kind of thing. But it's just that again, like Mike said, that nonlinear background because both of us kind of have that where it's allowed us to just be like, okay, well, if I can't figure it out, then you know, like yeah, you have to. <laughs> I always wonder with my background, like what job I could get at Walmart. Like what is, I mean, I know I, I've been I mean, producing. They do t- podcasts. I, well, I can do podcasts. <laughs> I can do podcasts. But I always just think about like, because a little bit like you guys, like I have nothing about producing television is linear. Like every show is like I did a I did the first tattoo show in the world. Okay, so I did the first cool. tattoo show in history. It. So yeah, it's called Inked. Oh, Carrie I, did, I, yeah. I watched every episode. So yeah, yeah. so Carrie, it was a very good show. It was like the first tattoo show ever. So. I don't have any tattoos, but I can tell you that I have more education on tattoos than most (laughs) any person that has tattoos. I watched, I mean, I did three seasons of tattoos and then dating shows and there's, but it's just problem solving. So you're an expert on dating then? Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh yeah. That's, there's no doubt. Well, I, am I, yes, I am. Um, We had this conversation the other day and I argue with, I was arguing with these groups of girls of just like. This guy went on a date and he had dated this girl for like a week and a half, two weeks on a trip. And he very much was like, well, I'm going to call her tonight and I'm going to let her know. I mean, what are you going to let her know? He was like, well, you know, I just need to let her down easy. (laughs) And I go, it's been two weeks. She doesn't care. I I go, she did. You went on a trip. He goes, well, you know, I don't want her to get upset. I go, go, it seems like you have a huge ego and that you're doing this for you. Yeah. It's two weeks. She lives in New York like, City. You're so you're amazing. Like, you're you're so amazing that you have to do. He was like, well, no, I just think it's the nice thing to do. And I go, dude, the minute you do that, she's going to go back to her girlfriend. It's like, I don't even know what the guy was talking about. He was like, well, we said some super intimate things. I go, oh, you said intimate things when you're intimate. I go, <laughs> oh, yeah, oh yeah. that's so weird, dude. You didn't just like go, oh, wow, that was really great. I was like, I don't know if you're hungry. Like, you say all the things. <laughs> yeah. But it was just, oh, we went on and on, and I was just telling them to do the fadeaway. But there was these girls that were like, no, I would want to know. And I go, do the fade out like everybody else. Like, just don't, you know, you call every day. You, like, <laughs> call once every three days, and then just be friends. Like, it's totally fine. Like, the, when it works out, it works out. You don't have to, like, tell them. They know. Yeah. And, like, and then she was like, no. And I go, look, I get it if we were both in Bentonville because if— if with the break, you know, right. then you, you're going to see each other, you're gonna see each other at Lady yeah. Slipper every Friday and yeah. Saturday night yeah. for the next like few weeks and be like, hey, you know, yeah. like just whatever. When I see you, I'll high five and, <laughs> you know, we do it other things, but we're going to see each other every day. Yeah. That's a different thing. But when you're in New York City and you're in Bentonville, I was like, you got a small town head yeah. and you got, you're talking about a girl has 10 million guys like at her disposal. She's going to be it's actually funny. I just had this conversation with my 19 year old like two days ago. So he just he did the the fade out with a girl. He did, and, and, and my wife was on the the other. Side. Of course, oh, tell her. And they oh. all the, and by the way, the girls yeah. all say they all say understand. this, <laughs> but then they say this, and then right after they do it, yeah. they'll tell all their girlfriends. They're like, I don't know what he thought he was. <laughs> he wasn't all that. I wasn't even into it. Like it's just you can't win. No. You can't win. But I do love. I'm about to do um, five weeks of a show, um, and it's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be you know be so wrapped up. It's five. Three celebrity men looking for love. Um, what should be say? I mean, well, maybe we can get a little pitch in there, you know, yeah. put them on a bike. Oh, yeah, yeah dude, yeah. yeah. You know, let's see let's what, see yeah, it. you let know. know. Get it in Atlanta. Yeah. You know, and maybe there's get a crazy background. girl on there that wants to steal his bike, so she'll pay attention there to him. Oh, you've already got it. Sounds like, like a great, great producer. Yeah, yeah, great like, storyline. Like, watch that. Yeah, it's a good storyline. <laughs> yeah. You know, let's see if I can get him on bikes, yeah. see if I can get the insurance for it. Um but it is funny, like I just, I was, I, you know, I'm going down this path and starting a show, starting a company called Planet Good Times, it really just feeds the community. It's more of like a, a promotion company that kind of starts parties, kind of doing what I do in reality TV. And then I have a media company called Label, um, and we're doing marketing, and we're going to start working with like Walmart and hopefully and all those guys. Um, but my background just kind of is problem solving. Like it's right. like none of this stuff makes any sense in how we're going to do it or how we're, you know, figuring out how to get to the next chapter, but you just, after pulling from all the nightmares of the problems that come on, 
Well, hey, if you're looking to join our team, we'd, we'll pay you nothing. <laughs> oh, dude, so I'm just, in. Just yeah. vision. Dude, I'm doing yeah. that right now. Mike always says, like, yeah, what is, he, what is doing vision. that right yeah. now? What's please. the, I am doing that right now. I'm <laughs> yeah. really killing it. Uh, yeah. what, is, uh, what has been the hardest thing that you've had to overcome with this like big phys- piece of device that about, keeps blinking at me? Physical product? Uh, just all of it, whatever, whatever it was. Well, I'll speak to physical product. I mean, physical product is just how do you basically make this thing smart, shove a bunch of stuff in there, and then also obviously try to make it where you cannot overcome it. Because we've, we've physically beat it up, put it in a refrigerator, you know, hit it with a mallet, like taking a grinder to it, doing all those things. And as soon as you do, as soon as you solve one problem, you like start messing with it and then another problem pops up. I mean, as a small little example, even just <clears throat> this little metal piece right here that wasn't there before, this one that's welded on. And uh, I, cause I took a mallet to this and it, and it eventually broke the locking mechanism. So the chain just fell out and I was like, well, crap, if you have like a mallet, you can just hit it real hard a few times and then they can just, your bike's gone. So I was like, okay, how do we solve it? And then you put this there. Well, now you solve that problem, but it's just, it's that constant, like, once you solve one, and you're not going to solve everything, but you try right. to get it. You're, you're, for us, we're just trying to lower that barrier as much as possible, compared, especially compared to what's out there. And that's where we talk about the whole alarm piece and the, uh, you know, hopefully skunk spray at one point. Oh, the so. yeah, spray you once because yeah. if you so if you actually do break it off, or if there's any kind of if, rattling, if, if, well, well, yeah, break off. Yeah, we yeah. put this thing through the freaking ringer. I mean, with every device that you can think of, you're not breaking that unless you're an angry person that just got sprayed with skunk spray. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, this thing is, is freaking tough and that's the way it was designed. So the fact that you don't have to carry it, you know, we're able to add a lot of components in there that you wouldn't carry on your own. So, um, but the hardest thing is just all the things you don't know. You know, when you're, when I was a buyer at Walmart, you, you feel really effective in your role. Like, I'm managing this big business. I'm making a lot of money. I'm dealing with 25, 30 suppliers, 200 SKUs. I got this, right? And then you come out to your venture and you're like, all right, great. I need to go to a sales call. Um, let me get the sales collateral. And you're like, oh, oh, yeah, I have to create the sales collateral. You know, so you literally have nothing. You're starting with a zero. And so every conversation that you have, every email that you send is from nothing. And so there are a lot of unknown unknowns, you know, when you're starting a, a venture. And there is still, like, I think that's what keeps us up most at night. It's just like, what are those unknown unknowns that are going to tank us? And then, you know, Clayton and I being very diligent about going out and trying to figure out, you know, as much as we can. Maybe we're not subject matter experts in every space, you know, Mm -hmm. like grant writing or logistics, transportation, university. But we know enough to find the people um, that know way more than we do. Um, And so that's been like our big initiative is like, how do we find the people that know all the things that we don't? Yeah, and building a team is tough. I mean, that's been our Oh, I'm doing that right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's been the biggest challenge because – Our mindset, you know, again, we've been doing this for two years, so it's like we're basically brothers at this point. I think I talked to him more than I talked to my wife (laughs) at this point. Sorry. Uh, Yeah, right. (laughs) Exactly, to both of them. Um, And so it's just we are just kind of one mind in that sense, and so we're trying to bring somebody else into our vision. And so obviously it's it's hard to find somebody that's going to have that same level of passion and, and drive as as we do to try right. and get this done. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced that. Yes. A yes. lot. It's also something Gary V. Yes. I don't quote Gary V. a lot. But that was the one thing I remember him saying like, yeah. in a social media ad somewhere that he was like, don't ever hire someone and expect them to care about your product Dude, as much as you do. Sure. He was like, because that's just not realistic. He right. was like, that guy didn't create the device and right. he's not going to get the 400 million if it does blow up it yeah was like you're gonna get all that and that's the whole point when it's yeah. tough too because like your pool of people that you're drawing from you know um a lot of my exposure has been you know really high level corporate and so you think that you can kind of draw on those personalities um but if you've been in corporate for a really long time you're used to that hr department and people say things to you a very specific way you know uh, a positive sentiment like hey i really appreciated how you did this um but Maybe we do better this next time, you know, and it's very positive reinforcement. <laughs> in a startup, you don't have time for that. No, it's right. Like yes. we have critically, like we are critically candid. Like Clayton and I will hate each other for, you know, five to ten to an hour a day, and then we regroup. That's because neither one of us, you know, like wrap our words in flowers. We say what needs to get done if it wasn't done appropriately, and then you know how to solve the problem. And so when you're building your team, it's like really important that you're finding those people that have similar values and are okay getting their feelings hurt. 
Because if you don't get your feelings hurt, you're not making progress towards anyone or anything. And then we work a freaking lot, you know? So people are like, oh, yeah, I would love to be there 9 to 5 p.m. It's like, yeah, that's the middle of the day. Um, but we're also, you know, up from 4.35 a.m. and we're still generating and pumping out stuff at 11 p.m. You know, Clayton sits on the line three days a week, four days a week at 10 p.m. with our dev team in India. You know, you, you put someone that doesn't have our values in that role and they see that as an inconvenience where we see it as an opportunity. And so that, like building the team, yeah, I'm yeah. glad you called that one out. Yeah. That, one was, that was tough. Yeah, yeah it's, it's especially here. I mean, there's people don't work past four o'clock. <laughs> right, yeah. But we yeah, we do. We, I mean, we, yeah, yeah, there right. are two of us here. <laughs> yeah, there's two. Yeah, there's two. <laughs> and you and, and, and we, yeah, me. Been, I, I, I mean, we have been fortunate. <laughs> you know, we've had some struggles here and there, but we've definitely been fortunate with the team that we've gotten now, where we have been able to find. You know, there's an IoT guy that's that does. He's used to that. And these guys are the other two people are they they have full time jobs. So you know we're we're on this full time. Well, they have full time jobs and are trying to also help us and, and great. support us. And that's. And, and, of course, we did that for the first two years. I mean, both of us just went on full-time, me, a month ago, you, what, two, three months now? Yeah. Thing. yeah. So, yeah. So it's been an ebb and flow. But uh, I think the key is probably just knowing how to fight with each other. That's true. It <laughs> is. Um, it's funny. I, I have a um, – I'm learning because, you know, we're starting a marketing firm and I feel like that the world of marketing is changing and it's kind of going into our, our world of like an unscripted kind of like – you know, content building instead of just like the old, the, the networks are all dying. So that's all going away. The way, kind of like the way you, you've learned how to speak. Um, I was trained in such a, a development world of working, you know, the, the tele, you know, the, the networks would give us some money for a development or whatever, or somebody was coming in for, well, just the, the other day, somebody came in and was pitching themselves and like, hey, I've got a really great idea, which usually starts with like, it's me. Um, <laughs> and you're like, you're really not that interesting. Yeah. And that's really the truth. And so when we hung up the phone, we all did that. You know, there's a group of people like, well, you know, there was they did this great thing and they did that. And I go, dude, it is a solid no. It is an absolute not even close to interesting. There's nothing about this that's interesting. I know that they were in the military. I understand that they have these interests, but – there's no save in Private Ryan. There's no – like yeah. there's a lot of people in the military, but not everybody had three – you know what I mean? There's not three brothers or whatever. Right. That huge story that makes it compelling. Yeah. Uh, so – but I don't know how the – I don't – I wasn't trained to do the flower of the words because it was like – it was just like we don't have time. time. Creating a show and doing the development on a show is so hard. Right. That you that you just learn, and I'm learning that I have to do all the flowery words right now because now we're in marketing, and it's like we can, and it's not necessarily true. I don't have that no anymore, because we were just joking the other day. Like my head is like, well, that's not what is on network television. That's not what people are going to buy. Well, now people are watching by the millions. People organizing the refrigerator. I just my wife watches that a lot. That's what I mean. <laughs> so it's like I have to totally re-engineer what I think. I'm like I was like, that's a terrible idea yeah. for a show. But it's yeah. like if we can create content that just goes viral, then that's right. just worth money. It's just yeah. like no matter if it's scripted or high unscripted or if unscripted you can ever or explain that to me. I would love to understand. It. It's just it's just mind numbing. <laughs> you know that chive TV stuff. I yeah. you know you're over at the first seat. It's crazy. All right, so well, so we dive into that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I do think that like building a team is really tough, and I'm, I've been very fortunate, fortunate or unfortunate. The TV world is kind of crashing, and then um, so I have all these incredibly talented people that are all looking for the next thing right. because we're all kind of hungry. And so I was able to like call like five or six friends after we came up with this idea, and it has come together very fast. And we have a we have the most incredible team ever now. All right, so you guys are big fans of Bentonville, right? Yeah, yes. I do. Yep. What do you love about this town the most? I mean, I know what I love. Again, about this. I, I grew up in this area, and Bentonville was nothing. I'm sure you've heard the story plenty of times, but you know, it was nothing. Oh, I wouldn't have been here. Yeah, I mean, 20 years ago, like growing up in you know the 90s, 80s, 90s here, I mean, it was like a ghost town up here. Uh, and then the trails built around it, and then, you know, hopefully nobody from Boulder listens to this, but like I came from Boulder, which is like a very much proclaimed you know, bike town, and it, you know, I got here, and I was like, man, Boulder has got literally nothing on Bentonville. Because the interconnectivity of the trails, it's, it's really like a testament to what, you know, trails and just outdoor community can do to an area. Like it, it, you see it, like it builds just 
the people come here, people just generally seem happier. You know, just the other day when it happened to be nice out in August, which is fantastic. Like I noticed, I even made this comment to my wife, like we were walking around 8th Street Market and I was like, the people were like, hey, how's it going? What's going on? You know, it's the and nicest, like, it's the weirdest place. <laughs> yeah. I love it. And then I mean, you get that. I love it so much. Exactly. Yeah. And then now my, my complaint when I came from Colorado was, you know, food. Uh, cause it's like, ah, oh, we miss food. And then music was a big one. Cause I'm a huge music lover and, and everybody always came through Colorado. She had Red Rocks and you had all the small venues in Denver of course. and Boulder. And then I came here and then all of a sudden, you know, I Moments. literally, we, we move up to, um, Bentonville from Fayetteville in I think 2020. And, uh, they announced the format festival and it's like down the street from my house. <laughs> Oh, really? so, yeah. And so anyways, it's just I think that they've just built done such a good job of kind of bringing in, you know, obviously the food and then the trails and then the music and just the whole scene with the arts. And it's just, you know, it's it's a great, great spot to be. And it's obviously perfect for us launch what we're launching. And you have yeah, kids and, and the whole thing. Yeah, and yeah. We both have kids and, you know, all that fun stuff. So. Now I want kids just got them bill. Right. You know, it's like you can babysit anytime. Anytime, three, pick three. Age. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah I, I got it. five. So yeah. Yeah. you have five. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of kids. Four to twenty-three. So really? Yeah, yeah. The three older ones are my stepsons, but they're all my my wife's kids. So she, wow. she claims all of them. <laughs> Damn. It's a lot of that's a lot of them. It's a fun journey. So just had five. It's a <laughs> lot of four. You got yeah. four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Far three off. littles at home, four in total. Yeah, so never a dull moment. But I think about Bentonville, like you really boil it down, like you actually get to exist here. You know, when you're in California, yeah. everyone's looking at their shoes or their phone. Yeah. And when they're walking, they're like looking down or they see you approaching them and they intentionally look the opposite direction. And you're like, gosh, like what is wrong with people? You know, in Benville, like you just said, people look at you like, oh, I'm actually here. And then they say something to you like, oh, hey, good morning. You know, and I'll say like my, my six-year-old son, you know, is growing up here and he's been, we've been here for the last five years so since he's one. And this kid says hello to everyone. Yeah. And I absolutely love it. Oh, yeah. No, I, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And so I think that's my favorite thing. People actually look at you. Yeah. I, um, I, I tell the story quite a bit. I may have to, I feel like people are actually listening to the show, like the guys that listen to it. I always go through these like things yeah. that I how much I love Bentonville. Um, and I may have said this a gazillion times, I because I lived at the base of the Hollywood Hills, so I walked to Hollywood Hills every single day. I just walked the Hollywood Hills. And I'm also a Texan, so people actually speak to you in Texas. Nothing like here, though. This is like the nicest people yeah. I've ever met in my good. And it's people that are come from other places that come here and they right. start being nice, which I also find interesting. But I would walk the Hollywood Hills and I would go and I would have my little dog. And we we're walking up and... I would do two things. I would see how many people would say hello to me in the morning with like looking at me because I'd said hello every morning. I would always go, hey, good morning. And then people would just walk past and they would not just not even look at you. Yeah. And you would think it would just be like maybe it's like a younger girl or a young coop, which right. you totally get. But it's like grown ass men. You're yeah. just you're like, like you can't say hello. That and happens. then the one that would really always get me. And this happened all the time. People would come up. You would go, hey, good morning. They wouldn't say a word to you. They would bend down, pet your dog. Oh, my God, it's just so cute, whatever. And then they would get up, and then they would walk away. And I was like, <laughs> that's not your species. Yeah. I'm your species. Yeah. So whatever. But, yeah, like, uh, Bentonville has been um, the biggest shocker for me. I moved here just because of a girl, and then, um, you know, that that's moved on, and then— now, um, did she fade away? I have to ask. I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry. No, it was, How did it, fade away? it was, it was, it was not, a, it was not a fade. I still love her to dearly. You know yeah. what I mean? So she's still, you know, she's still around. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, there was no fade away. There was, <laughs> there was, there was no fade away. No, I moved here for all the right reasons. Um, but now I love this. You can't get me to leave. I'm just like the spot. I'm, I mean, I have serious thoughts of like, one day I want to be mayor. Like, yeah. why not? Nice. Like, I want I want to be all in on yeah. this place. You know, I really just think it's the coolest place well, and the, the nicest the place. The opportunities and, here are kind of wild. I they're mean, wild. For us, because there's been so many kind of VC conferences and all that. And we've literally talked to entrepreneurs coming in from New York. And, you know, him and I are connected with venture capitalists. And we've had deep conversations with a lot of them. And uh, these people from New York are like, man, how did you even get a meeting? Like, we cannot even get a meeting. And we're just like, oh, well, I mean. Yeah, we're just connected with them, and you know, they're some of them are even mentors of ours, and it's just like these opportunities, like you, it's easy to take for granted. Yes, especially as a startup, as like what we've had available to us, and um, you know, because it's not like that at a lot of places. You know, we had that midcon BC, which was here, 
and they had 300 VCs from all over the world. I mean, there was some big names. Yeah, I was I was here, and I was like, yeah. I was listening to. I just I just went upstairs. I didn't even. Yeah, exactly. Just, yeah, you just I walked just, upstairs. I just walked upstairs, yeah. and I <laughs> met a friend, and I was like, oh, sit down. Yeah. Next thing I know, it was like it was one of the one founders of, of PayPal. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And I was like, wait, he did what? Yeah. I was like, Pay- so he knows Elon Musk? No, he doesn't. Yeah. And I was like, oh no, he yeah. yeah. Oh okay. Oh, this guy's. Yeah, this guy's right. <laughs> like, a different you know, kind of I mean, rich. You know, he's he's not where we live. Come on now. Yeah, he's no. small potatoes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good point though, is because you never know who you're surrounded by here in Bentonville. Yeah. No, you know, yeah, you're you like have... riding a bike with some grimy ass dude, and you're like, oh, oh, that person's worth five hundred million, half a billion dollars, or you know, yeah. it, it is. Cr- <laughs> I tell my friends all this. And we, by the way, this whole marketing company that we started with, shout out to Aaron. Uh, my buddy Aaron uh, was VP of Leonardo DiCaprio's company. Okay. And so um, I went home and I was like, dude, you should just see like um, like the CMO of Walmart, William Y. Like he's doing all this really cool stuff. He's making scripted content into whatever. And then and then I was like, and you wouldn't believe. I go, dude, Walmart fashion is on the up. <laughs> and from that moment, he just looked up and he goes, excuse me, what would you say? <laughs> and I was like, dude, Walmart fashion's on the up. And I was passionate. I'm yeah. like – passionately telling him the truth and he was like well i mean like and it, it was like it just spurred a level of jokes that yeah. have never stopped and but i'm still serious about it i'm like no you don't understand it's it's getting on the up yeah. like one day i'm gonna be wearing it's not yet but yeah. i one day i'll probably be wearing some walmart stuff you get real defensive about walmart i think that's some part of the indoctrination process yes. that you're <laughs> <unaware of. laughs> like, because i thought i was, I was never at, yeah, yeah. I, I, someone's I used, like walmart i'm like what do you say about what'd walmart? you say like yeah what'd you say you got some with you got you got some you got some with aisle 35 you got problem with aisle 35 what you go to Target? Like, you come, would t- on, come on, Target. dog. What is yeah. that? Yeah, exactly. Little you don't old. even realize you do Yeah, that. come on. No, yeah. It, yeah, it's funny. I, I am very, I don't have no connection to Walmart whatsoever. <laughs> but I, and I, and by the way, and sorry, Walmart, but back in the day, my mom would be like, oh, we're going to Walmart. Like, you don't get out of Walmart no more. Yeah. I was like, stop going to Walmart. You're going to get killed. Yeah. You're going to get killed going to Walmart. I just did never go. And I was like, just, mom was like, you can buy shorts for $2. And I was like, no, now I'm all in. Because you're risking um, your life. Well, we have, yeah, so, like, yeah, you're risking, thing, yeah, you're right, risking your right, life, yeah. which is, yeah. you know, not I risk low yeah, cost. To be fair, we have really fancy Walmarts here. Yeah. We, we, get all, it, we get all the best shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, this <laughs> Walmart here is a whole different thing. Yeah. Um, where, yeah. I have to ask, so where did you grow up in Texas? So I grew up in Dallas, uh, Lake okay. Islands, okay. Lake Islands, North Dallas. Both my parents went to TCU, so oh, okay. a, lot, a lot of connection to. to yeah, I went to yeah. North Texas and then uh, University of North Texas, and then decided I wanted to be a comic or an actor, and flew there, and then nice. that was That's brutal, the and then yeah. then yeah, and then found a way into music television, and then and then Jersey found my Shore. way to reality, and then Jersey Shore, <laughs> <laughs> and then all the Jersey Shore nonsense, and then uh, well, and then Flavor of Love, also you know. Nice. A lot of iconic, you yeah. know. You saw my you I saw did. my resume yeah. of trash. <laughs> Some of the biggest. It's pretty solid. Yeah, one of the biggest, best resumes of high end trash you can possibly Jeez. have. And um, <laughs> but I'm proud of it. You know, yeah, people. Man, you some people get really upset, and I'm like, I don't know, man. It's good storytelling. Yeah. I don't know what you want, but yeah. like, and I was in charge of a lot of the characters, so. Um, I, mean, I don't know how many I'm, seasons Jersey Shore had. It's a lot no, they're well, they're still going. My Is buddies, going? yeah, my best, my <laughs> friends own my one of my best friends, Sally and Sosano, owns the company, and then my best friend. Uh, Sean Hogan is still the EP on the show, so they're still doing it. And actually, uh, Polly D is coming to Fayetteville, and uh, a little dream, Polly. If you're watching this, I know you're not, but if you are, um, yeah, I'm gonna try to get. I would if I could get if I could get Jersey Shore at Blake Street. Oh, is my is Blake Street Shore? I like it. If I could get the kids <laughs> at Blake Street House, would be unbelievable. Um, do you want to show me how this thing works, or is it kind of there? Yeah, no, no. no. I think, I think yeah, I'm not. Let's see here. Let's make sure. Let's see here. All right. Yeah, so super simple. Open up the LockStop app on your phone, and then you just scan to unlock. So you have, you know, very similar to all of your other micro mobility <laughs> solutions. So I'll go back so we don't miss any of the three all right, steps. There we right? go. Um, so as I do, you know, right now it's locked. So imagine you're coming back from the bar, the cafe, church, wherever you're at, and you just want to unlock it. So scan to unlock there. Gives you a little cue. And then... Hold it above the area, and then that's it. Wow, that's dope. That's super simple, right? Yeah, keep it simple, you know. And then, and then you just put it back. Yeah, and then no, like, so it, it doesn't. It doesn't allow you to lock it if it's not if you're not connected for obvious reasons. So people can't just come up and lock it. 
Yeah. Um, so because I would have been that kid that went up and locked yeah. every, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And so, so, you, um, so yeah, it'll, it'll just like sit there and, and then we'll, we'll put a hook on there as well at some point. But the reality is, is that most people are just going to drop it. So. Right. Of course. Yeah. hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. It's metal. It's fine. Yeah. So, it's going to yeah. be okay. Right. Yeah. So yeah. It'll, it'll just sit there. But um, yeah, like I said, that's, that was intentional to, to be like, Hey, we can't just have it, you know, be able to just, boop. you know, all of a sudden some random people logging random stuff. So. Yeah, and, you know, we try to, again, make it very simple. Like, when you go up and you're getting ready to lock your bike, you know, you're getting your, your visual feedback here on the front end, and then, you know, you're also getting very similar feedback in the application um, just to make it ridiculously simple. I gave my 6-year-old my phone, and, you know, my 6-year-old can't read, so don't judge. You know, he's, he's in school yeah. for that, right? <laughs> um, and I said, hey, Cross, go unlock the lock stop. And, you know, one, he doesn't know how to function a phone. I'm one of those odd parents. They don't spend a lot of time on devices. And so I open the app for him and, you know, he's clicking the buttons and, you know, he comes up and the, he did have an issue though. I'm going to be real honest. He was too short to hold his phone above the device. <laughs> and so uh, after I lifted him up, my six-year-old son who can't read locked his own bike to the lock stop. And uh, man, that dude was so excited. You know, just by locking his bike. That's out. very cool. And so the reason it's blinking at you so much is that it actually has a motion sensor. This thing's battery powered. Okay. Uh, and so we put a motion sensor in it just so we're not draining the battery all the time. Yeah. And uh, so it will turn off and go into like a sleep mode, that kind of thing. Here, I'll so, lock it, Clayton. Yeah. So you can go for it. And, and again, very similar, right? So you're you're coming up to the bike lock. Is you have your mobile application open. Everything's ready. In your application, it's going to check the status. I'm like, okay, is this lock, you know, good? Um, mm -hmm. We put in some fail safes there. So, you know, you don't lock up to a lock that's going to die. We come out and replace battery. Um, so, again, so all you do is scan the device or open your QR code there. I raise it above the, the thing. Gives you a little yellow indicator. It said you better hurry up. Um, and that's it. That's simple and then when the lock is locked you uh, go to the screen in your application and it tells you hey here's how much time you've been locked up and so you can kind of see here it says lock is secured it tells you the time you've been locked up and then the cost um, associated with that so try to make it ridiculously easy that's really awesome man yeah that's really cool man well, I love what you guys have done. I think that, like like I said, like interviewing all the people that are really doing cool things here in Bentonville is what this show's all about. And I, I, I think that you guys have something cool. I can't wait to, like, lock my bike up and... Because I've really, I really do just drive around, like, like yeah. and I bought nice bikes. Yeah. I actually buy really nice, yeah. like, cruisers. And if they, if they got stolen, it would really change yeah, my life. Like yeah, well, I bought one. You know, yeah, yeah. Like, so it's really, like, same yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I am a guy that buys nice stuff, and you only need, you know, I yeah. believe that you just buy some few nice things and then mix it with some Walmart fashion. We'll, we'll definitely get it out in front of Blake Street, uh, you know, for, for our own selfish reasons. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love it. Well, is there anything else, guys? Man, I think we covered covered the basis, unless you want to do a deep dive on, uh, you know, Jersey Shore or something. <laughs> well, if you want to talk about Jersey, we can talk about, we can talk about the inner, I don't know if it's um, acceptable because there's a lot of things. Well, guys, this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Appreciate you for coming on the Good Time Show. And, um, yeah, let's go riding. Yeah, man, for sure. We appreciate you having us. All right, Sweet. Well, that's our show. If you didn't get a chance to watch the episode, check it out on YouTube and Spotify. You can also listen to The Good Time Show on Apple Podcasts or any other platform. We are always trying to grow our Planet Good Times community, so subscribe and follow us at Good Times Us on almost all social media platforms. This episode was presented and recorded live at Blake Street House Sound Lounge in Bentonville, Arkansas, a social club where people from all walks of life come together just to be themselves and make the community a better place. Till next time, good times, everybody.